Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for being here tonight. My name is Asia Celestino. So I'm going to jump right in, do a little intro for you guys with a history lesson. Since the early days of entertainment and the motion picture industry, Native American culture has been a source of fascination. Just over 100 years ago, some of the most influential white directors found inspiration in the Wild West shows and laid the foundation for the Western genre in Hollywood. While these films are held dear in American arts and culture, it's no secret that the earliest productions, and even some in recent memory, reduced Native Americans to caricatures. Even for Native American actors who were able to benefit from the popularity of Westerns with smaller roles, it was still difficult to make a living. Tonight, we have an actor and activist who has been integral in changing the Hollywood stereotype of Native Americans in modern film. Through his successful acting career, his dedication to the craft, and memorable portrayals on screen, he has opened up the world of filmmaking to include more authentic representation for Native Americans, and he has paved the way for more opportunities for Native American actors to explore humanity with non-traditional roles. Please join me in welcoming Wes Studi. Oh my God, where is that person? <laughs> Thank you again for being here this evening. Oh, my my pleasure. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I just uh, it's a nice little walk down from uh, 58th Street, and uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, turning out. It's uh, so. Can we kind of start from the beginning? I know you have such an illustrious career. I have to go back and ask you about what your childhood was like growing up Cherokee in Oklahoma. Oh, growing up Cherokee in Oklahoma is not uh, probably, in retrospect, not the uh, best way to grow up. But on the other hand, uh, um, it's uh, it's good to have a background. It's good to have a background from uh, um, a solid family connection. Uh, someone that uh, having people around you that are, uh, of course, uh, supportive and uh, uh, of yourself. I was shocked, however, the very first time that I reached out and looked out into the larger mm, uh, society, if you will. Yeah. And it's made up of non-Cherokees, people who spoke something else than I did. Um, and that was at about the age of about five or so. And um, yeah, it was kind of a, a shock. So to you know learned that English at five, right? I began to learn English when I, uh, when I uh, was put into a home, like a... In fact, I just uh, visited the old home here about two weeks ago uh, called the Murrow Home for uh, uh, for Indian children, if you will. Um, and uh, they are a f group funded by, uh, I think, Baptists, or, you know, one of the, one of the Christian... Uh, faith in the northeast of uh, of the United States and um, I um, I was placed there by my aunt who was going to Bacon uh, College Bacon College is known for producing uh, Native American uh, uh, what do you call them? Pe people who go out and uh, recruit more uh, missionaries. Excuse me, missionaries. Thank you to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Very they, interactive yeah. audience tonight. Yeah, if you, if you know of uh, Bacon College, that that was where my aunt decided to persuade my family to put me into a home there at five or six years old, so I could go to a 
public school. And what was the reasoning behind that? What did she think you would gain by going to a public school? The reasoning was that um, rather than going to the school that most of my uh, uh, siblings, cousins, siblings, cousins had gone to for over uh, I don't know a hundred years, was that if I went to a uh, that kind of a school, then I could gain a better education. So. She did, and there I was. I was put into a home with uh, uh, mainly kids who were referred there by um, by the courts and such. You know, uh, peop- uh, kids who were not uh, well taken care of at home, and that was my introduction into the world outside of Cherokee. I know that you didn't initially aspire to be an actor, but now that you look back on your upbringing and your childhood in particular, do you think that you had certain aspects or characteristics of an actor or an interest in performing? Uh, no, I don't think so. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> Actually, I had no idea that I wanted to be an actor. Um, in fact, um, in fact, what I had done, uh, maybe a year or so around that uh, time period, I had asked my father, hey, after watching uh, Jay Silverheels on uh, The Lone Ranger, yeah. Um, I forget what his name was, but uh, Jay Silverheels was a character that I looked to and I said, very much like I look at you and I say, wow, hey, you're a brown person, right? I am. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, uh, that's very interesting uh, as a young man. And I thought, hey, Dad, you think, you think people like, think I could do something like that? He says, no, no. He said, no, you can't do that. You got to be six foot tall, have blue eyes and uh, blonde hair. To be, you know, to be a uh, um, an actor like that, and uh, I said, okay, well, I'll leave it at that, you know. And and when I went on about my business, uh, so I never really thought about it until uh, God, I guess I was thirty or forty years old, and I got into um, a um, an acting group called the Tulsa Indian Actors Group, something like that, uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And uh, I was amazed at the fact that, uh, wow, all you really have to do is learn these lines, say them in front of people, and uh, they'll clap for you. (laughs) (laughs) So it seems like you didn't take your father's words as resistance to pursue what you wanted to. And to your advantage, you were able to carve out an acting career. But I kind of want to go back, even though I'll want to revisit your time in theater. um, I just want to touch on your time in the military, because I think it probably informed a lot of your acting from combat training to those experiences and kind of a wealth of emotions to pull from in your acting career. So what sort of decision-making process went into joining the National Guard at 17 years old? Well, the reason I joined uh, (coughs) the National Guard at about uh, 16, 17 years old was the fact that uh, Wow, uh, these guys get to uh, march around. Um, Shalako is a, a school at that time, wherein uh, we had a buildings like built around an oval, and uh, on uh, Sunday mornings the National Guard guys got to come out from their armory, which was about a uh, half mile away from everything, and they got to come out there and march around 
the oval a uh, couple of times and then back to the uh, armory. And what I noticed about the whole thing was that, well, the girls would just get out there and, wow, <laughs> look at those guys in those crisp, crisp uniforms. So it was purely for the ladies. And you didn't really think about the actual <laughs> implications of joining. The larger part of my life has been for the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> but then you went on to volunteer for active service in Vietnam. So what was the thinking behind that? Well, I have to tell you that uh, at about... Uh, in the late 20s or early 30s, a young man begins to think of, of uh, what, what in the world is it that I am here for? And uh, you begin, I myself, personally, I have to say that I began to think, well, am I a real man? Am I a warrior? Am I somebody who can actually make an effect in the world? I know that my father was in Korea, and I know that uh, my father before him was in World War II. What about me? Can I do that kind of stuff? You know, I have to ask myself, can I do that? It's an um, it's a question of am I capable of actually doing what it is that people do in the world as warriors? So I had to find out. So I've, I volunteered actually to go to uh, Vietnam to find out about myself. I really didn't care about the political, the social uh, issue of the whole thing. I simply wanted to find out about myself. Can I do that? Am I capable of doing that? I, uh, I spent a year there and found out that, yes, I can. I don't like it. I think it's an awful freaking thing that people do to one another in warfare. The, the process of war is the ugliest thing that a person can ever see in their goddamn lives. It's true. When you see bodies wrecked from the effect of concussion to them, when you see bodies, when you see skulls that look like cracked eggs lying before you there, <coughs> and the whole effect is that the commanding officer says, well, just sleep, slip them off into the water, push them off, get them get out of here, that kind of a thing. It's, it is extremely ugly the things that we can do to one another. That is what I found out what war is all about. Mm. So transitioning back to normal life, did you find that to be a difficult experience and how did you cope with all of the things that you saw in the war? You know what I actually did when I came back? When I came back to peace, <laughs> to peace from a for, from an unpopular war, if you will, but I always ha had to ask myself, what is a popular war, <laughs> as opposed to an unpopular war, right? <laughs> oh my God! I came back to a. Um, to people who said that, oh, listen, my friends told me, don't even mention it, man. Just, just hang out, because nah, we don't, we don't want to talk about that crap, you know. That's because it's, uh, you know, it's like it's like when I first came back, the army actually told me to, uh, 
go to the PX there and get yourself some uh, c civilian clothes. Don't go home in your uniform and stuff, you know. Yeah, don't go home in your uniform because everybody's spitting and throwing shit at you anyway. You know, it's it, it was it was not a a good time to be a soldier. So uh, yeah, that's what I did. I uh, I uh, I got uh, civilian clothes and went home. And uh, the uh, <laughs> the craziest thing about the whole was that uh, uh, I got home and my mother, she said, uh, hey. Uh, what I want you to do is uh, put some bleach in your bath water, cause you smell like you're some you're from somewhere else. <laughs> it, that was something else. Uh, so I, I I took uh, bleach baths for a couple of you know, weeks or so, something like that, and uh, got back into the uh, American uh, form of life. Uh, and I, uh, I really didn't appreciate it. I really didn't appreciate it. You know what I, what I, continued to remember, was, um, in Vietnam, the people look very much like me. <coughs> and a lot of the guys who had, uh, like, uh, surrendered. They they were called Chuhoi, Chuhoi because they had surrendered, and they said, and they would look at me and they said, "E, you same same Vietnamese? Eh, you same same Vietnamese? You know, like that." And I thought, "You're right, I am same same Vietnamese like you," and because only about a hundred hundred fifty years ago, my people were fighting the same people that I am hooked up with now. <laughs> Holy mama. Yeah, that was, a, that was an awakening. I said to myself, Jesus Christ, what am I doing here, you know? Uh, but I made it through the year in Vietnam, came home, and uh, actually wanted to go to war to go to war with the USA. So I I joined up with uh, the American Indian Movement, AIM. I don't know if any of you remember AIM, but AIM was a uh, was a a group of people. It was it was a group of people who said we have had enough, and it was mainly urban Indians, urban Native Americans, if you will, that. Uh, said, we have had enough of this shit. Uh, we understand how the tribal administrations are continuing on with their <clears throat> lapdog kind of uh, uh, agreement with the USA that, uh, yes, we are a dying race and all that, and that we will soon be gone and people don't know who in the world we are anyway. Um, and the American Indian Movement awakened in me a pride. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. These freaking Americans can't be, excuse my language, running over us for uh, for freaking forever, we have to at least make a stand saying that we will no longer be your goddamn mat and lap dog and you will not run over us anymore. Right, and we followed in the steps of the Black Panther. We said, well, if, if the Black Panther can take up arms, we can take up arms even better. So that's what we did. The American Indian Movement talked to our youngsters, <coughs> and we continued to speak of we have the right to sovereignty. 
The fucking white man has had enough. He, they have totally, absolutely, totally taken us to the point of beaten down people, <clears throat> and we have had enough. That was what happened at, in 1972, when finally the a wonderful group of people put together <clears throat> put together the Trail of Broken Treaties. The Trail of Broken Treaties uh, started out in uh, California and marched all the way across the United States to Washington, D.C., a, with a suggested, a suggested 20 uh, resolutions to what, how we can put together a better uh, situations between the reservations, Indian country, and the U.S. government. There were some wonderful, wonderfully written suggestions on how we could actually do this written by scholars like uh, Vine Deloria, um, <coughs> Hank Adams, people who had actually put some real thought and academic uh, reasoning into how we could better the relation between American Indians on reservations and in Indian country and the U.S. government. This is what we had to do. 20 points of resolution that we wanted to talk to the Bureau of Indian Affairs about. What happened was the uh, uh, Capitol Police, who called themselves Buffalo Soldiers, as a matter of fact, at that time, <laughs> got into an altercation at the Bureau of Indian Affairs building, and all hell broke loose from that point. So what did the Indians do? We took over the freaking building. We just ran into the BIA. We took over the damn building. And what else could we do? Jesus H. Christ. I mean, uh, it, it was not a... It was not a good thing, but we did it. We did it. We took over the building. We held it for two weeks or thereabouts until uh, Russell and um, Russell Means, if you remember who he was, Dennis Banks, and other leaders of the American Indian Movement began to deal with uh, B the BIA, the Interior, and... Uh, um, after about two weeks of holding that building, um, we left. The problem was that while uh, <clears throat> the press is a wonderful thing for uh, uh, the American uh, Indian movement and, and such, um, what happened at that point was that um, while we got great press attention, and people were, began to ask, well, what can we do to alleviate this situation? What can we, uh, the American people said, what can we do to, uh, you know, alleviate this? How can we, uh, uh, can we apologize? Can we, what, what, what can we do, right? And, at that point, we, we as Indians, American Indians holding the building, were <laughs> kind of in a situation where we had to a answer the question, well, what can you do? We don't want a freaking apology. I know that you people came over here because you were driven out of your own damn country because of whatever reason, you know, I mean, I know you were pressed to come to America or this brand new country or whatever that you called it. It was our place. We had a different set of reasoning. We had a different way of looking at life wherein, no, real estate, 
<laughs> the idea of real estate doesn't freaking exist. You made it up for crying out loud. In any case, in 1972, real estate exists, right? Okay, so we have to deal with that. But, <clears throat> so we finally gave up the building and said that, okay, uh, we didn't get a chance to reckon with your political leaders. You did not give us a chance to reckon and speak with you about our grievances. Uh, so what happened at that point was we moved from the Bureau of Indian Affairs back into our own communities and began to build resistance we began to build resistance in terms of let's build our own tribal communities. Let's build them and make them into forces that are a part of what we believe in, what we want to do. We are sovereigns. You know, the larger part of the world does not recognize the fact that we as Cherokee, Navajo, Arapaho, Cheyenne, whatever, all the tribes in the states, in the United States, are sovereigns. They're just as freaking powerful as your goddamn U.S. government in terms of sovereignty. But in the 1970s, that is when we as American Indians began to learn that, yes, that's who we are, that's what we have. Be why? Because we have, we have made treaties. The Cherokee people of the world made treaties with Britain, with France, with Spain, way before the goddamn U.S. government ever became what it is now, you know? I mean, we are older than America. We always have been. And that, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's my sort of uh, ram scrabble kind of uh, political ideology, if you will. Two really powerful experiences, the military and then your political activism and time with Indian politics, both sources clearly of passion, trauma, and so much insight to yourself. I'm wondering, where does acting come into all of this? At what point are you like, I'm going to be an actor? Uh, well, I'm going to be an actor came a about in terms of uh, cowboys and Indians. Uh, the larger part of uh, cowboys and Indians wound up at Gower Gulch. Do you know what Gower Gulch is? Gower Gulch is on uh, is on uh, Sunset Boulevard in uh, L.A. It's a tiny little place next to a studio. I think it's um, mm, yeah, uh, next to a studio, um, and that's where most of the westerns were made back in the like 50s and 60s. And Gower Gulch is where it, it's like a, well, it's a little shopping mall, you know, with a Chinese restaurant and a bar and stores and whatever throughout. And that's where all of the extras would hang out. <laughs> across the street from the, uh, uh, the studio. And the studio would send people over and, and uh, check out these guys and uh, whenever they needed them. Uh, uh, I had a good uh, a friend that I met at Gower Gulch. Uh, not that I, I was never an extra. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> but, but, but I had a good friend who uh, um, told me about uh, uh, hanging out there as a younger man in the uh, Chinese restaurant, which had a bar. Um, so it was kind of like 
the older version of central casting, but a little bit more laid back in a mall with Chinese food and a bar. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And uh, my friend, he was um, um, he was from New York actually. He had gone. He had been uh, in uh, in L.A. for uh, a number of years, but uh, he said that you know uh, he kind of pulled me aside and said, you know what? Uh, I don't know where you fit in because uh, it's like, uh, see those guys over there and those guys over there? Uh, well, they're schmohawks. And those guys are a wapahos. They're, they're Italian guys. <laughs> <laughs> they're Jewish guys. <laughs> How did that make you feel? <laughs> I mean, I know well, the industry has changed, but when you realize that those people were making money doing background work and portraying your culture how did it make you feel well actually i had already seen them on uh, on tv screens and whatever right yeah i mean it's like uh, <coughs> i really don't know how to put it into words but you uh like um uh, this fellow right here if i were to dip him brown and put a feather in his head, hat, you know, he would still look like that white guy with a feather in his hat with brown paint on, right? <laughs> right? Well, I mean, you can recognize, right? When, you, when I saw Jay Silverheels as Tonto in the, ter uh, the, the series Lone Ranger, I can look and say, oh, yeah, he looks like me. I mean, he looks like my people, mm -hmm. you know? You know that. Uh, but then you also see these other people who are, who have been dipped in brown, uh, you know? <laughs> and and uh, they're, they're not, they don't really look like Indians, you know? Um, uh, so how does it make me feel? It makes me feel uh, weird. Like, I'm, uh, it makes me feel like I'm an other. Mm. I'm not of you, or am I, right? And so it does make me feel like a, an outsider. But it led to a role. Huh? You being there and being authentically Native <sighs> American led to a role, and not an extra role. Mm. No, again, it was the basic drive of, uh, I don't know what it is so wonderful about women, you know? <laughs> 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 yeah, that, you know, my, my friend, uh, he said, hey, take a look at this uh, workshop. Uh, these, uh, they're putting together <laughs> plays and things like that. And I looked in and oh my God, it's like, uh, you know, 75% uh, women and 25% men. I said, oh, I like the <laughs> odds. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, that's, that's really what got me into the whole thing. And I, uh, but soon afterward, in terms of uh, getting on stage and... Um, portraying something, uh, portraying someone else's idea of a story was, uh, well, I found myself useful. I found myself uh, to be a part of something that was larger than me, and, and it allowed me to be uh, a vehicle wherein I could tell a larger story that said something to the public, you know? It, it was something that uh, I thought, wow, I could really be a part of something that was uh, meaningful, you know, something that uh, could become a part of my own legacy, if you will, you know, hopefully for the good. 
So did you go on a lot of auditions before you got your first role, or how did that come to you? Oh, that was no, 1988, right? No, no, right? no. I, I just went to Schwab's uh, drugstore and sat there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, I, I lived in LA, in L.A. for about about uh, three years or so before I ever landed any kind of a booking. You know, uh, I did a western, and then I did a film uh, called Pow Wow Highway. Mm -hmm. Does anyone? Know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Gary Farmer and uh, A Martinez. Uh, were the two leads in that thing, but uh, I had a great time doing uh, uh, kind of a cowboy, in, in cowboy kind of a guy. And all that. Do you remember booking the role? Uh, no. <laughs> you weren't excited? Of course I was excited. <laughs> I, I was totally excited about doing it, yes, but I don't remember exactly why, how it came about. Sure. You know? Yeah. Do you remember the experience of being on your first set? Obviously, you had a role the year before, but do you remember Pow Wow Highway? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What was yeah. that like? Well, I walked into a, walked into the damn cafe and said, "Hey there, Filbert, how you doing, man? I mean, it's like you are doing really good, but your truck looks like shit outside, you know, or something like that." But myself, I'm going to. Uh, Billings to find a little bit of fa la la. You know what I mean? You know. That, can, that that's what I remember of it. <laughs> so by this time, did you have an agent or were you still representing yourself? Oh jeez. You know, what the wonderful at that time at that time in the eighties there was a wonderful group in LA called uh, the uh First Americans in the Arts. And they and what had happened in the years before my venture out to LA was that Jay Silverheels and the late Will Sampson and um, and a few other uh, natives, what they had done was put together a what was called the American Indian Registry at that time. And what they did was uh, they put together a a book very much like SAG has a, a group a book you know of actors and they and it was mainly Native American actors that they uh, put together and the great thing was that they had contacts to agents mm -hmm. wherein they helped anybody who came into L A to become an actor. <coughs> They help them find agents, and that and that's usually the hard uh, in in 1980. That was like the hardest thing to do was is was to find an agent. You know? I'm curious now that you're discussing this group of actors, and I'm sure a lot of our audience of actors and creatives and filmmakers can kind of understand this feeling. Did you feel camaraderie? or competition when it came to other Native American actors? What was that network like? <coughs> well, like I say, the American Indi Indian Registry at that time was more of a camaraderie. Um, I came into the business at about uh, 35, 40 years old. And uh, of course there were younger people and there were older people uh, who had been in the business for a good long while, but uh, uh, there was a certain amount of competition, of course, in the age, age and look group. Of course, there's some uh, competition, but the larger part of it was, Jesus Christ, what are you doing here in the belly of the beast? You know, kind of. Uh, a camaraderie in in uh, L.A. because it was a very small group of American Indians who were even trying to be in in movies at that point in time. You know, it was. Uh, um, I'm 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 happy to say that there are more and more and more 
uh, young people who are becoming involved in in the business now that are American Indian. Uh, but uh, at that point in time, it was very easy to uh, uh, pick ourselves out of the crowd, even even with the brown Mexicans and or s Central or Southern uh, American Hispanics there, right? <laughs> it's like we dress just a little bit different or we have a different, little bit different look wherein you could actually look into a crowd and say, oh yeah, yeah, that's an Indian guy. <laughs> you know, I'm, he looks like he's from South Dakota. <laughs> Gee, that guy looks like a Seminole, you know? Oh yeah, oh. <laughs> Easy to see that Dene and that Navajo guy, you know. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it all of that has kind of uh, uh, changed over the years. Wherein you can't tell anymore. You know, it, it's difficult in any case. But Ethnically ambiguous. Yeah, we've we've become ambiguous. Yes. So I kind of want to launch into your filmography. And as well. <laughs> Ambiguous. <laughs> if we were to discuss all of your credits on IMDb, nearly 100, we would be here forever. So I'm just going to touch on a few. I'm going to try to hit I'm everyone's six foot two. favorites. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so 1990, Dances with Wolves, You Were the Toughest Pawnee. It was one of your breakout roles and really memorable. What was that experience like? Dances with Wolves? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it actually uh, kind of got me on, got me on the page. Uh, it it uh, provided me with work uh, throughout the nineties, actually. And what I did was, uh, uh, Michael Mann was the director, and. Uh, he had uh, <coughs> told all of the uh, agents and whatever, it, uh, don't bring any pictures. Don't. Um, I don't want to see any pictures from anything else or whatever. You know, I mean, whatever you've done, I really don't care. I, I just want to see you. You know, more or less is it w was the word. So, I snuck in a picture of myself from uh, Dances with the Wolves. You know the shaved head and the mohawk and all of that, uh, the that sock and fox look. And I just kind of left it on the desk there as I went in for my audition. And the audition really was it was more like, hey, how you doing? Uh, I'm from Chicago, man. You know, uh, I don't know nothing about energy. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. You know, are you all right? Yeah. I said, yeah, I'm all right. Uh, <laughs> and... He said, uh, and it was a matter of uh, something like, uh, I got this part here, but uh, it takes some introspection. He said, do you know what introspection is? <laughs> I said, I've been living with it all my life. <laughs> <laughs> but in any case, yeah, about two weeks later, I was in North Carolina shooting uh Last of Mohicans with uh, with with Michael. It was um, a very uh, yeah. It was a good. It was a good, uh, good conversation, and uh, then we later went on to do Heat as well mm -hmm. with with him. And uh, it, yeah, it's it's good to uh, hook up with people who you feel like are real uh, masters of their craft, right? For Mohicans, you were also playing a character who was a villain in a sense, but had a story and motivation and depth. And I think that was recognized early on. Did that make you proud to know that your initial mission to kind of give a well-rounded, fully developed character was coming to fruition with that film? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, you know, Actually, how it how it came about was that um, when I started out, I had a a, uh, a 
trailer uh, that was like had uh, one bedroom and uh, and a living area and a bathroom, right? I mean that's the essential. That's that's what SAG provides us with is that trailer. Haven't gotten that yet. <laughs> 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 Looking forward to it though. Well, as time went on with the character of Magua, uh, I think Michael began to think in terms of wow, this guy could be something. You know, this guy could be a little bit more than what James Fenimore Cooper wrote, you know? And he began to kind of build it more and more. And as the as the uh, script began to build more and more, so did the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> After a while, I had two bedrooms. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was great. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> I'm not sure that I was able to appreciate it at the time because uh, you know I'm like a new actor, right? You know, it's like yeah, you had it easy almost. You came yeah. in, you didn't have any extra roles. You just get this role. You have an awesome trailer. It's getting bigger by the day. <laughs> Seems like a dream. <laughs> I like the way you put it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll be your publicist now. So, because you mentioned heat, I have a question from the audience, and I know if I don't ask this, I will get accosted outside. So, um, sorry, let me switch it. Uh, this is Sally. Sally? I'm sorry, I can't read your writing. If you could raise your hand. Um, so, on heat. How was it working with Al Pacino? Did you have any special prep together or techniques used? Good stories? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know what? What I remember most about that whole thing was Michael, man, would let Al Pacino just like go, and there was no cut. It was a matter of shoot Al doing everything to the point of roll out. There was no cut. It was a matter of what in the hell is he going to do next? <laughs> ah, ah, ah. You know, it's he. You know, it. He just followed. <laughs> his, you know, his lines would end, but Michael would just keep on shooting him, s just to see what in the world he would do. You know. <laughs> so, how did that inform your preparation for filming on that set? How did you prepare before that movie, or in general, and did that change your approach to that character? Not really, because it, it sort of goes back to stage work, you know, wherein you're always on. It's like the cameras are never cut. It just goes on and on and on and on until you get some sort of cut, right? But that's the whole thing, is that you, you stay in character throughout until the until you get a final cut of some kind and uh, that's what uh, I watched him do uh, Al Pacino uh, just keep on uh, working to the point of what stage down or somebody says cut right were you ever intimidated on any of these earlier productions when you came to set? Um, you know, intimidated. I, I met De, De Niro. De Niro kind of intimidates me a little bit, but then I figured out, no, he's just quiet like that because he's trying to intimidate you, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and so I figured, nah, nah. These guys are 
are in the business the same as I am, and they make more money than I do, I am sure. But uh, um, I just figure uh, they're on stages like I am, right? A good lesson for all of the different actors and producers and directors in the room that the dynamic is there and that everyone plays a role in the production at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. It's a, it's a, it's a matter of uh, everybody is a cog in the wheel. And the, and the wheel doesn't turn if that cog doesn't work. You know? So in our talk, we kind of glazed over 1993, which was your lead role in Geronimo, an American legend. So we have another audience question from Heidi. What did you do to research Geronimo? Did you use stories from life or family or outside sources? No, not really. Um, Geronimo has been an icon for uh, Indian kids for like forever. You know, it's, it's uh, <sighs> Indian kids in the world in America <laughs> are are. It's a difficult situation to be an American Indian in, in USA, United States of America, because <laughs> what we uh, we were the enemy um, 150 years ago, um, and and the United States of America tried to crush our way of life, uh, tried to try to totally. Well, they, they actually tried to fucking kill us away, right? I mean, wipe us out. They're in the damn way. And I, I understand that. I mean, they came from Europe. They came from Europe, and they wanted a place to live. So <laughs> they took over this place by force. And uh, um, it, it, it's, it's difficult uh, to be a reminder of your own bad actions we are the conscious conscience of america wherein they they know what they did yet they americans know what they freaking did to us and are still trying to do to us and try to get us out of the way you know but uh Unfortunately, we're still here. <laughs> and, and, and we will persevere, uh, no matter how we can go about it, because we've mixed with you. I mean, I'm Scott, and you're probably American Indian yourself, you know, or, or something. We're all in a great big old bowl of, uh, of, uh, Diversity. Yeah, there you go. And, uh, who knows what kind of human we're going to produce by the end of, um, the 2000s, right? My God, it might be a wonderful person, or it might be a an absolute villain of the world, you know? I don't know. Hopefully but, uh, we get there, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so moving on through the career of West Studi, prestigious movies on TV, 1996, Crazy Horse, 1995, uh, Streets of Laredo, later in 2007, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. Did you want to speak about any of those? I also would love to talk about 2005, The New World. Ah, uh, the new world. Uh, that was uh, Terrence Malick. Mm -hmm. Terrence Malick. Starring He's Colin Farrell, Koryanka, Kilcher, Christian Bale, the last two whom, uh, which you also worked with on Hostiles. Exactly. Yeah. That. W that yeah. It's a very small world when you when you think about it in terms of actors and Indians and you know it. Uh, it's a very small world. Um, it was fun to go through your filmography and kind of see those different connections and yeah. how working with someone can possibly lead to another project down the line. Six degrees of separation. Um, 
you know what I learned from uh, uh, hostiles was a uh, a connection to my niece. Have you ever heard of Delena Studi? Delena Studi is my niece, and she's she's working right now uh, on. I- on on a play here called Gloria, Gloria Steinem story, uh, at the Daryl uh, Roth, Roth, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, what what made me think of that was the the fact that uh, um, she's playing Wilma Mankiller. Wilma Mankiller was a uh, woman back in the uh, 80s who was actually uh, mm, pretty much grew up in the Oakland area, uh, urban Indians. Uh, uh, And uh, she came back to Cherokee Nation in the 80s at about the same time I came back to the Cherokee Nation in the the 80s. And uh, uh, as time went on, I got fired and she went, she became (laughs) <laughs> Principal Chief. <laughs> How that came about, I don't know. But anyway. Uh, uh, small world. Small world in that uh, uh, Christian Bale uh, was a young man at that time in the 80s. And uh, his father married Gloria Steinem at... Uh, Wilma's Wilma Mankiller's house. That is full circle. <laughs> How weird. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't know that until Christian himself told me about that. Uh, uh, and he also said that his name is not Christian; it's Chris John. Hmm. That's what he told me. I don't know. He could have been, you know, carrying on, but. Uh, uh <laughs> crazy thing about him is that he has this extreme uh, Welsh accent that he to- he's, he's he's totally he can totally hide it you know mm-hmm. i mean he he sounds like an american guy right <laughs> what was it but like to work with him both on the new world and also on hostiles i didn't really know him i didn't really get to know him on uh the uh, new world uh because we're well, the parts, the characters were so far apart. Uh, but then uh, on hostiles, it was uh, uh, like uh, an everyday thing, right? It's like, uh, uh, hey, how you doing? Uh, yeah, you could use a breath mint. <laughs> <laughs> so you two would break out of character on those long days. You didn't stay full method acting the entire time on set for Hostiles? Um, I, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, I, no, I don't think that's you know, uh, method acting. The only person I know of that does that kind of method acting business is uh, Daniel Day. And so I asked Daniel Day one time uh, when we were doing Mohicans, like, uh, hey, is it true that uh, you, like, stay in character all the time that you're, uh, you know, doing this film? He said, no, man, I just do that to keep people away from me. (laughs) (laughs) Now you've told the secret. No, I didn't. No, <laughs> that's not true. I lied. <laughs> <laughs> now there are going to be extras on sets with Daniel Day Lewis coming yeah. up to him, knowing. But he's retired, isn't he? Yeah. Is everyone? <laughs> yeah. Doesn't everyone say they're retired until they're not? Gene Hackman told me that. Uh, yeah, uh, I announced that I retired, and my phone just stopped. You know, just it just rang off the wall. He said after that. <laughs> so I've been thinking about doing that myself. <laughs> just quietly back away into a corner and don't tell anyone. So 2009, we have Avatar. 
And I think this is a really fascinating role for you because you also served as a language consultant on the project with James Cameron. So what was that experience like taking on that position in addition to acting? Oh, it wasn't difficult in terms of we, we worked with uh, a linguist and a <coughs> language specialist out of uh, USC at the time. Um, and so we more or less built the uh, language of Navi, uh, some kind of uh, sound in terms. Um, <coughs> we just um, language in its own sense is like what? It's difficult as well as it, as it is basic. It's like, can you make a pleasant sound? And put it into a say uh, a sound with ah or a vowel sound. What is a pleasant sound that you know of that you can make? I don't even know. I don't even think of <laughs> what about language uh, of sounds. Uh, uh, that's nice, right? Uh, makes you feel <laughs> kind of good. Uh, well, so, so good could be a word like, uh, or something that you favor would be on, uh, on, uh, something like that, right? Soothing. Soothing, something nice, something that makes you feel good. So you incorporate that into what kind of uh, sound that you make into a word like uh, <coughs> uh, good. The, the concept of good would be like on, on, I'd on, right? Yeah, so, and then you go from there uh, and build, uh, build words and sounds. And uh, linguists are uh, extremely uh, good at cataloging those things. And then, yeah, it's an amazing thing where wherein humans at some point in time decided that they wanted to communicate with words. And uh, here we have a, a language, right? We have how many languages in the world? More than 12,000 or so languages in the world. And you're a leader and also doing work to preserve indigenous languages, correct? Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, languages um, have a great amount of value in terms of how we see the world, how we treat the world, and how we um, communicate with the world, uh, and how we actually uh, how we actually deal with. Our environment is a uh, is hidden within the language itself. You know, it's like a respect for the Mother Earth, the what we live in, where we come from. Do we respect it as a living thing, or do we respect it as just an environment? You know, uh, I think that. Uh, the languages themselves sort of define how we relate to the earth, how we relate to life itself and other people. Back to Avatar, I want to kind of discuss, because largely a lot of your work earlier on in your career, Westerns, you think of on-set locations and sprawling scenery and all of the physicality that goes into horseback riding and combat training and all of that. On Avatar, you were faced with new technology and green screen and motion capture. What was it like working with that tech as an actor? The only thing that really changes in terms of motion capture is the uh, makeup and wardrobe. The basics remain the same. You, you are still an actor. All of that does not change. Absolutely 
Um, <clears throat> what what you have, rather than wardrobe and makeup, is like dots on your face and uh, and the uh, motion capture suit and all of that, uh, and you work in what is called a volume. Um, but otherwise, uh, you're still an actor. You're still out there hoofing it. Hmm? Moving on to 2014, you were in A Million Ways to Die in the West. That was directed and um, one of the stars, Seth MacFarlane. <laughs> other cast members, Charlize Theron, Liam Neeson, so many others. What was that experience like? You're already laughing. No, I, I just did a couple of day, a couple of nights on that shoot. I was <laughs> Oh, yeah, uh, um, I, I have to give kudos to uh, Seth MacFarlane in his own uh, crazy way of looking at the world. It's uh, uh, truly bizarre and out there at times, especially in that movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, and and I can appreciate comedy. I mean, that kind of comedy that uh, actually looks at the world in terms of, uh, oh, God, you guys take yourselves too damn seriously, you know? And, and that I think that's what he does. And I I think he's funny. Are there As certain American guy or whatever, and uh, the other one that he does. Uh, Are there certain kinds of comedy presently that you draw the line at? or that you feel are not appropriate for your caliber of work at this point and all that you've done? Oh, yeah, yeah. I would never do stuff like Adam Sandler does. Yeah. You know, Ridiculous Six and all of that. You know, it's, it's just I thought it was... Hey, it's work for Indians if they want to do it. <laughs> but uh, myself, uh, no, I, I wouldn't do his kind of stuff. We're coming to a close pretty soon, so I want to get in a couple more of these audience questions for you. Mm -hmm. So, oh, this one's a good one. These are both good. Phyllis, you said you'd like to play a lead role written from the Native American perspective. Would that be a period character or a modern day character? And do you have a character in mind? Well, you know, most films uh, are based on pretty much the same uh, method, right? Like Shakespearean movement, right, throughout. And uh, what I've always said is that I, I think I would, uh, I would like to do a King and I. I'd like to shave my head, actually. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, the King and I, or uh, like a an Iago character out of the uh, the, the Ham is, is it Hamlet or the other one? Uh, yeah, that one. Yeah. Thespians, <laughs> a crowd of thespians. Yeah. Uh, over the years, I think I've uh, been building toward that, and I think before I die, I will. Our next question. Oh, I'm so sorry. I think this is. Jake Henry, maybe? What's next for you in your career, in your life, in addition to what you just said with this character? Uh, what next? what are you dreaming of, and what do you want to accomplish? A Grey Goose martini straight up with a twist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can find you one. <laughs> Somewhere next door, maybe. Beyond that, are there long-term goals that you've been kind of holding on to and still anticipate progress to be made on? Yeah, I think I need to do some work on my legs, you know, kind of make them bigger or something. <laughs> 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 I don't you just uh, kind of take each day as it comes? Huh? You kind of just take each day as it comes? No. <laughs> I get up in the morning and I make my coffee and I plan my day, <laughs> which usually ends right about 11 a.m. <laughs> 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 
That's the life you can lead when and you start out without having to take <laughs> extra rolls and getting trailers. And go from there, yeah. Yeah. So uh, again, we're in a room of actors and creatives and filmmakers. Are you all actors? Oh, you poor people. Oh, my God. So not Wait. even creatives and filmmakers, <laughs> just straight up actors, performers. No creation, just all performing. So could you impart some advice for the next generation? Because we know that you are actively participating in mentoring and providing programs for the next generation of performers. What is your advice for aspiring actors? Get a life. <laughs> you heard it here. <laughs> No, no. Well, I, I really don't. And and the larger part of other actors will probably tell you the same thing in that, uh, no, I don't have any advice for other actors. Jesus Christ. I mean, I've got to make it my own, own, on my own, and so do you, right? I mean... Is there something to be said about embracing your type or embracing what you have to offer and then building on that influence from there, maybe? Um, I don't think so. Um, no, I, 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 would, I, I actually do want more Native Americans in the business of acting. And uh, it's really... Um, I think it's a an affirming thing in terms of our young children to be able to see people on screen that look like them and know that yes they are a part of the world they are a a functioning part of the world and they are important I think it's uh affirming to uh to see your own uh, racial group or subset of group or whatever you, you would call ourselves in this world, uh, to, to be able to know that uh, you are recognized in the world of entertainment and uh, I, I come to the point sometimes wherein I think that, well, why do we have to depend on television or movies to affirm ourselves? But on the other hand, um, as young people, I think, uh, you know, six to 18 years old, uh, I think they need something to look up to or not look up to as much as just sort of affirm to themselves that they, yes, are important and are a part of the world. Absolutely. Representation matters. And media is such a powerful vehicle and can transcend all of our differences. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Wes Studi.